Thank you, Heloise. Um, it's a real pleasure to be in this uh, group, and um, I feel like I'm just picking up the baton that I, I will really um, converge around questions of what next, or at least how do we think about it theologically next. Um, Prenatal Screening Amidst the Politics of Nudge Units is the title that I've given um, for a topic that I will locate within um, political um, ethics. And the question I want to open with is how do we usually think about political ethics? Uh, which laws are good or political policies just? Um, which candidate or party to vote for? Which, or which ethos do we engage in the life of society? So those are three ways in which we tend to think, okay, what is right and wrong um, in, the, in the political domain? Um, within that framing of political ethics, um, we have a set of shared assumptions, and it's those shared assumptions which I think I, I want to exposit today as moving toward um, the dynamics around the, the Heidi's case um, so I'm sort of moving toward why is Heidi's case perceived the way it is within our political culture. So these are what I take to be shared assumptions about politics in our world. Modern societies are better and more humane than pre-modern societies. And um, to be part of that society and to be a good citizen of that society is to invest one's energy in improving society. So, uh, all the political parties as we know them are only disagree on the direction of progress. Um, uh, therefore, as Amy Laura Hall in her book on Julian of Norwich very nicely encapsulates it, to be a good citizen in the United States and really in Western liberal democracies means getting your fingers typing and your phone buzzing uh, and your feet marching to try to push the world upward for the better. Uh, in short, we're all progressives. We're looking for progress. So um, we can summarize that by saying that the political ethos that is characteristic of modern democratic societies is that good citizens are engaged citizens, um, they are active citizens, and they are making the world a better place. So far, I, t I trust that none of this is very contentious. Um, where it becomes where the wrinkles start to come in is how we define um, progress. And um, I did my doctoral work on technology. I'm surprised that the technology hasn't gone uh, off yet because that's usually the fate of someone who wrote on technology is to, ha to have the gremlins of technology attack them, but the clicker's even working, so I'm really pleased about that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so modern t societies, again, I don't think this is really out of the ordinary to say that they, we, we live in a technological society and that we think technology is a major, major motor of what we call progress. And one of the things that comes with progress is, uh, is, is wealth, um, uh, comfort. So in technological societies, people are wealthier and they suffer less. So when I'm talking about technology, I'm really talking less about uh, you know, computers and more about the way our whole infrastructure is organized to position itself. And here, um, uh, Richard Snow very nicely defines modernity as uh, what Henry Ford invented. Uh, and Henry Ford uh, encapsulates some of these themes really nicely when he says that um, the remains of the old must be decently laid away, the path of the new prepared. That's the difference between revolution and progress, right? So he's contrasting the old world of upheaval, the, the, the French Revolution, um, uh, the, the, the Reformation. Those were, those were revolutions, but progress is a progressive, slow improvement of, uh, of the world. And um, it is tied together with industry, as the second quote highlights. If a young man wants to fit himself to the politics of tomorrow, let him fit himself into essential industry for the purpose of learning how best to conduct the whole public good. So we can see that for Ford, he's articulating an early version of the good citizen. Get, uh, 
uh, get connected with the progress of kind of industrial civilization understood in uh, the way that he reorganized his own factory. Um, we had a we had an American tour with my family who really don't know America at all, and we went to his the plant in uh, Michigan, Dearborn, Michigan, where he uh, where, where he first, the Rouge plant where he first sort of integrated um, uh, car manufacturer, and it really is the template for uh, our world in which. Uh, we think of industrial production as the, the road to um, uh, making things sort of work better so that we all are better off. And what, is, what does that entail? It entails standardization. Replaceability is one of um, Ford's main uh, insights that we don't need to have craftsmen making every part because then the parts will vary a little bit. We need to have craftsmen making machines that will make identical parts that can be interchanged. So that's called standardization. Um, and to, uh, for those parts to be replaceable, they need to be manufactured precisely. Um, and that means an emphasis in making things on quantitative me measurement and finally quality control. So the aim of uh, technology as we see it developing as an infrastructural project of the modern world is to control quality by weeding out faulty parts. And that creates confidence in the capability of the technicians, right? The ones who make the machines to make the parts which don't have variants. Um, and the aim of this whole process is to ensure that customers get what they're expecting at what they're expecting and that it works well. Now, um, to, summarize, uh, to summarize where I've gotten to so far, uh, technological rationality is the way in which we define progress. Right? That, that's when we think the new iPhone comes out, we think of that, we experience that as progress, and, the, and I've tried to give you some of the logic of why we experience that as progress. And I'm now going to move to point to some of the ways in which that technological rationality and that politics of progress inevitably comes to shape how we view other human beings. Um, I think the, this, the, the defining of progress by technical rationality is what Roger Brownwood was yesterday calling utilitarian ethics. Um, that the greatest good for the greatest number is a, is a way to define the good for, for everyone uh, and um, utilitarian ethics plays a very specific role that I'm gonna come back to shortly. But Roger Brownwood was explicitly speaking about one of, that being one of the positions that's driving this discussion. Some of you who are my age or older might recognize this picture. It was from a famous album cover from Nirvana. Um, and the, the function of the picture was to draw attention to the way in which we are swimming in a world that, that we can't get out of. Uh, and um, you know, the, the dollar bill on the hook is a way of saying that the um, uh, plenitude, wealth, finance is, is one of our key environments. And um, I've sort of used this, a line from Romans 12, um, uh, which says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, and do not conform to the schemas of this age, right? So what are the schemas of this age, and how do we see them? Or how do we see them when we're in them? Um, uh, the, if uh, a kind of rock band can see that the schemas of the world are problematic for us. Um, uh, Paul, I think, is reminding us that Christians are trying to ask questions about the status quo in their societies, uh, which are very hard to ask questions about uh, in the way that our immersion in money is hard to ask questions about. Um, but we're also immersed in technology. and. Um, we're no longer a natural humanity as a result. I'm introducing 
the young man I'm going to talk a little bit more, this is Adam. Um, and Adam wouldn't be here except for his immersion in technology. Uh, this is week one for him. He had several forays into the medical domain. Um, and I, I really like, he's under, you know, the Billy Rubin light that makes him blue. But I wanted to pair this picture with the Nirvana picture because um, the, the two uh, sides of the environment in which we live are money and technology. But, of course, Adam wouldn't be part of my life if it wasn't for technology. So we don't, we don't know anymore what we are shorn of immersion in money and technology. It's an achievement for us if we are to act naturally because, um, you know, we, we wear glasses and we, we have fillings in our teeth and we take antibiotics and people like Adam and I suspect Heidi wouldn't be here without technology. So um, we don't find it easy to live as natural beings and nowhere is that more obvious than in the domain of reproduction. Um, Right. We, we must choose to reproduce now. Choice is built into how, how our reproduction proceeds in the modern world. And um, the reason we know that is that those who would um, proceed in a wholly natural way, meaning making no choices about reproduction, are now seen as irresponsible parents. So uh, responsibility means controlling quality and this becomes this you know the image of the fertility clinic and the human embryo being um, injected reminds us that if progress and technology and money are our environment we should be totally unsurprised that we start thinking in terms of quality control in relation to our reproduction and in fact this is how uh, fertility control tends to be presented um, uh, this is just a, a randomly chosen uh, page from the London Women's Clinic talking about, uh, well, sort of touting their wares for uh, in vitro fertilization. And you can't really see the print at the bottom, which runs like this. We have over 25 years of experience in helping people to achieve their dreams of having a family. Note, using the latest technology and techniques, right, that's the modality of progress to give you the best chance of having a successful pres pres pregnancy. That's the happy customer and taking home a healthy baby, a quality outcome, right? So Ford would be really pleased with this way of talking about reproduction. To make that connection explicit, we, to, for, in progress, we need to weed out faulty parts, create confidence in the capability of the technicians to produce high quality outcomes um, and ensure that people get what they expect and what people expect is to eliminate faulty outcomes, meaning suffering and to produce wealth for all of us. We can see why the discussion that we're having about um, uh, the new prenatal testing techniques fits perfectly within this logic and it's, um, it's, very it's gonna be very difficult to dislodge this logic because it's the way that our whole society is put together in much wider ways than just prenatal questions. Um, I'm summarizing now some material that I survey in more detail, which I, in Wondrously Wounded, um, uh, and I won't go over it in detail now, but uh, we're all familiar that um, in places like Iceland and Denmark where there is universal screening, um, the uh, kind of uh, Down's birth rates uh, have, have plummeted. And we also know in the United Kingdom that those who get the uh, uh, prenatal diagnosis of Down's before birth, the termination rates are, are very high. Um, and the reason I'm not going to go into the details is that they're very familiar. Um, but I want to draw out uh, an experience that I had um, the week after the abortion law was repealed in Ireland. Um, uh, and I was in a, a big park in the middle of Dublin and 
uh, there, I saw multiple Downs people. And um, the logic that I've been trying to tell you, trying to sketch here, explains why it's not a statement about the legalization of abortion to say, with the legal of abor legalization of abortion, we know what's going to happen to the faulty units in the reproductive process. Right? And I've given you the larger picture of why that should not surprise us and why, therefore, um, that we need to separate the legalization of, of abortion from how people abort, uh, which is the topic that I want to move on to now. Um, if you don't know uh, Gareth Thomas's book, Down's Syndrome Screaming, Screening and Reproductive Politics, you really should know it. It's a, it's a fantastic book. It's an ethnography of um, a region in England, and he just goes into um, prenatal clinics and sits and does ethnographic description of what goes on in those spaces, how, how it proceeds, um, and how you get from, um, well, I mean, what I found most interesting, he pointed me to a set of literature around the sonographer is the one at the boundary. And um, uh, uh, sonography, of course, separates the woman from her fetus because before sonography, uh, the, you can only feel that the baby is there with you. But once there's a picture, that personifies the baby uh, th as another. And then a, very quickly, um, a decision has to be made about whether, by the sonographer, whether this, this other will be um, distant from the mother or bonded to the mother. And um, that, that literature I survey in Wondersly Wounded, but I find uh, it's another example of how we're not natural humans anymore. Like we, we separate and either bond or, or, um, and ha or have to uh, distance in a way that no other generation ever did. And he also observes, we've also not really discussed these publicly. Cutting edge reproductive technologies are often extensively debated by the media, and yet no such debate debates were or have ever been organized regarding non-invasive prenatal testing for Down syndrome. The speed with which a technique spreads doesn't necessarily reveal its social acceptability thus masking possible controversial social values embedded within it. The routinization of Down syndrome screening in many countries across the world, the UK included, has ensured that non-invasive prenatal testing, like its predecessors, haven't been subjected to public scrutiny other than within the campaigns of the disability right groups. Um, so the, uh, uh, Thomas is raising the question of whether there has been a serious con uh, consul public consultation about um, uh, these technologies. And he says, his, his, sort of, he suggests the answer to why there's really never been a serious public debate about the advisability of uh, widespread and universal um, use of these kind of tests is that it is a, what he calls a, a public secret that um, we both recognize Down syndrome people are here and want to value them publicly and want to think of ourselves as valuing them, and yet there's a, a wide social consensus that we shouldn't, they shouldn't be here. And that's the public secret. That means we can't have a working debate and haven't had a working public debate. Um, I'll see. It, it, um, Dawkins famously in 2014, when asked by a woman uh, whether he should, she should abort a Down syndrome pregnancy, he expressed what I'm calling this public secret. Um, uh, he just said, abort it and try again. It'd be immoral to bring it into the world if you have a choice, right? So he's stating the logic of progress. It, when he says it's immoral, he's saying progress means we must do um, uh, we must do uh, what is the greatest good for the greatest number, and that means you must abort. Uh, and he explained that more in the, his initial comment when he says, if your morality is based as mine is on a desire to increase the sum of happiness and reduce suffering, the decision to deliberately give birth to a Downs baby when you have the choice to abort it early in the pregnancy might actually be immoral from the point of view of the child's own welfare. 
So this is perfectly explicable within the logic I've uh, uh, presented um, from the kind of technological definition of progress. Down syndrome is a fault. Uh, we have the technology to, de to detect and delete this fault. Uh, modern pe people should want to act to make a world a better place, and aborting Down syndrome pregnancy produces, reduces suffering. Um, as I'm drawing to the close, I want to introduce you to these two beautiful people, Stephanie and Adam. Um, uh, 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 Stephanie is Southern California beautiful, and Adam is Down syndrome beautiful, and um, they have given me permission to tell their story here. Um, we moved to Germany when Stephanie was seven months pregnant, and I had a degree in medical ethics, and she is a nurse. Uh, in fact, worked with John Wyatt uh, in his unit in uh, University College London. And um, like Liz Crowder, we knew that we weren't interested in aborting this, this baby. Um, and uh, so we, we asked only um, for prenatal testing that could be explicitly explained as being for the health or the mother of the child, or the mother or the child. And um, uh, that meant, in part because we moved so late, uh, and in part because we set this criteria, and actually we didn't know Adam was down when he was born. Um, and he was born at home, so, uh, I mean, the whole um, midwifery system is different in different countries, and we could talk about that as well, but um, uh, he, we didn't know for quite a while for sure that he was Down syndrome. So I. I really um, resonated with Moy Wilson's comment that um, she, you know, she wanted to have joy uh, in the birth, and I I still can't pat, get past the story of going down to the bakery. started, I've got to finish, um, uh, going down to the bakery the morning he was born and telling the ladies there who didn't speak any English, it always makes it worse when I'm tired from uh, a good conference and haven't slept much. Um, but I wouldn't trade that for anything, and we, we had that chance. Um, and uh, in fact, we found out that Adam was Downs um, uh, when Stephanie read the charts when he was in the hospital later, um, which is a whole other story, which I do tell in Wondrously Wounded. What we discovered, uh, which is very much what I, I heard Moy Wilson saying yesterday, is that uh, we discovered that in our world, our medical world, prenatal care assumes a willingness to screen. And if you're not willing to screen, you start getting into all kinds of practical conflicts. So how does this work? Um, just to summarize why, the, how those conflicts are put together, We'll only care for those children who reach a quality standard, um, and we not only could, can, but should deny entry into citizenship for people who are deemed faulty, and every human will be routinely quality tested before we're gonna risk loving them. And it, it becomes our new natural to um, screen before care, and the unnaturalness of not screening gets coded as bad parenting or irresponsible parenting. Um, we're living in a very new moral world. I just want to pause and point that out. Uh, only in 68 was prenatal diagnosis a possibility in the real world. Um, and that coincided with the liberalization of abortion laws. So that's, historically speaking, also very new. Only in the 90s was um, uh, amniocentesis first 
sort of a workable technology, and only in 2010 were uh, non-invasive blood tests per perfected. So, you know, uh, it, it's, it's no surprise that there's a lot of things happening that we haven't really thought well about or how to speak about because we're only a dozen years into this new regime. Just to make it explicit, I'm, I'm not introducing the topic of the recriminalization of abort abortion. I think that would be hard or even immoral in a secular society to um, try to tr criminalize abortion. But what I'm, I am asking us is to consider the, the kind of moral landscape in which uh, it seems right or even incumbent for some people to abort. Uh, and uh, the abortion debate really tends to over elide this, these sorts of questions. Um, now it is a uh, sort of dog whistle words to even bring up the term eugenics, and I only bring it up now to say that we um, we uh, the reason it's a it's a problem to talk about eugenics is that what happens now is very different from the older view, which was improving the gene pool, uh, right? Like let's go let's have a program to make the gene pool better, cleaner. Now we let people choose, right? You, you do what you want to do. Uh, and the hidden assumption there is that most people are going to make rational choices, and the choice uh, rational has been defined as for progress and equality. So uh, uh, even if we're not uh, uh, pursuing a policy of eugenics, we are pursuing a policy which um, does have predictable outcomes. And I've tried to give you some explanation of why those outcomes are predictable. And the main difference between the world we live in and the flatly eugenic universe morally is that nobody today actually says that people with Down syndrome should be eliminated. Um, Annie Waldschmidt, uh, as a, a philosopher, she um, points to there's a shift in the way law works that is parallel to a shift in the way um, morality works in the modern world and that uh, she calls it a normalistic moral norms versus uh, uh, sort of punctual or point moral norms. She describes it this way, completely voluntarily in line with the ideals of autonomy and self-determination we orient ourselves to the middle of society to average norms we want to live in the way that other people do. Most importantly, we want to be normal. If we feel enjoyment in deviation, it's only because we want to march to the beat of a different drummer, but only for a little while. By no means do we want to be permanently localized at the negative pole of the spectrum of a certain behavior or characteristic. Right, so in the, in, the, in the old world, in which classic eugenics happened, there were laws criminalizing things. There was yes, no binary, do it, don't do it. There was uh, enforcement in place. In our world, um, uh, it's all about choice. Everybody makes their own choice, but there's incentives and disincentives, hence my title. Like nudge unit is governance by um, suggestion, by incentive, by carrot and stick, but nobody is ever punished for making a decision in our society. It just becomes a higher and higher mountain you have to climb. So in our, in our world, the good citizen is the normal citizen. Right? The older regimes decreed behaviors and punishments, and the newer re legal regimes incentivize normal behaviors and make outlying beha behaviors difficult. And the gain is that nobody feels coerced, or nobody believes that they're being coerced. Um, Rosemary Garland Thompson, who is a, uh, uh, a disability philosopher, um, very uh, influential and important, um, says she uses the label velvet eugenics. And the reason, uh, you know, it's the velvet revolution she's making a reference to. And the difference between the old eugenics and the new eugenics is that there's no coercion and it, it has a kind of valence of high class, uh, uh, high quality. So in the new status quo, some people might choose to march to the beat of a different drummer. How you doing, uh, Adam? This is, this is Adam marching to his own beat. 
Stephanie talking Are to him. Going and for a walk? Him talking as much as he ever and talks. Stick. Two playing away. I sometimes show this bye bye. show this bye. film because um, <laughs> the the word nonverbal is a is a slippery term. Um, said and unsaid are uh, a wide band of um, interactions. Okay, back, back to our, um, our utilitarian. Once confronted, uh, um, Dawkins did make a sort of apologize, a, a sort of apology for his tweet. Um, and uh, he really, it really, he says he's, he, he's sorry that he let slip the dogs of Twitter war. Um, in other words, uh, he doesn't really retract the claim, but he, uh, he says, oh, "Well, I shouldn't have provoked this sort of uh, this sort of situation." And I, I, you can't really see it very well, but it's worth noticing um, the label under which he's addressing us here: the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science. Uh, so he's he's transparently presented himself as the mouthpiece of rationality, and I hope I've displayed to you why he is actually channeling um, the, the rationality of our age. Uh, uh, to make that explicit, his clarification of why he said what he said is that some people do oppose abortion, abortion, religious people, but I'm defending what most people today think and in fact do. That's a, a quote. And he further more, more challenges us, might that not give you pause before you accuse one individual, me, Dawkins, of being a brute simply because he spells out the thinking behind the majority choice. Um, the normal might, uh, normal people, majority choice, uh, the reasonable people uh, make the rational choice, but there are other unreasonable people. So um, we li we're living in a new status quo. Our moral normal is this is the, the, the environment in which we're immersed. And I think Dawkins is probably right about what most people believe. And uh, Stephanie and uh, Moy and Liz certainly experienced uh, what it means to live outside of the statistical mainstream. And uh, being in the business that I'm in, um, I get to hear lots of interesting stories about Christians uh, in different parts of the world like James, I, we didn't get his full story about his adoption, but um, it, there is uh, places in the Christian community where um, the, the, the outsiders, those outside, are still being taken into, uh, into families. And I want to suggest that that is um, uh, a continuation of a long Christian tradition. Uh, when Christianity arose in Rome, the, the paterfamilias, the, the father of the household, had the right to choose or, or abandon any child. And from the first Christian centuries, Christians rescued foundlings. Uh, abandonment was the way that, that they um, did infanticide. And Christians were taking those children in from very early. And I've detailed some of this in my book, um, uh, uh, Christian Ethics, um, Disability in the Christian Tradition. I should remember the titles of my books. Um, so I would, I would suggest that those Christians today who are considering um, bringing into their families the, the, the outliers of, their, of our society are in continuity with some of what happened at the very rise of Christianity and, and part of what made Christianity attractive, um, that they, 
there was a repudiation of the idea that only perfect bodies are worthwhile. And the way the logic went in the patristic era was um, uh, Christ died for, for every human being, right? It wasn't human rights, it was Christ gave his life for, for every child born of a human. And they also understood our shame or embarrassment around non-human lives as, as a mark of sin. So um, I, I want to end by trying to uh, pull together some of the, what's involved in our living in a time of rival citizenships, rival definitions of the good, uh, of the good life, of the good citizenship. Um, there's a contrast between um, good citizen as some, someone who sees some lives as faulty and progress being the reduction of those faulty lives versus um, citizenship in which we see all lives as a gift. Um, that ties together with an, a, a vision of citizenship as prudently progressive. And, and as I've pointed out, that really is kind of how we all think about politics, prudent progress, versus something like a lived witness to solidarity with all human lives. Um, uh, uh, of, of recognizing our interdependency, or as also from Romans 12, Paul points out, each member belonging to the others. And finally, um, we can think of political e ethics as serving a collective self-improvement, right? We're trying to bring ourselves together as a society into a better, more progressive place, or as simply caring for everyone in society. I'm fond of using the, um, the phrase Paul uh, addresses to the church in Corinth where some are getting, where the rich people are getting drunk and the poor people are, uh, are hungry at, at the collective meal. And his response to that is, you need to wait for one another. Um, uh, and I think the politics of collective self-improvement and the politics of waiting for one another have very different um, uh, ways of playing out on the ground, and one of the ways it plays out is the one that's brought us to this discussion today, is that um, we, it, it's, it's, it ha in our world, it's becoming countercultural to care for children that's in an unconditional way. Uh, that's something that is almost impossible for us to conceive. That's it for me, thank you.